What's up, Notre Dame fans? Mike Singer from Blue and Gold with our two beat writers, Patrick Angle and Tyler Horka. These guys are going to give their game-by-game season predictions for Notre Dame's 2022 upcoming campaign. Before we get into it, make sure you guys hit the thumbs up on the video. Support what we're doing here at Blue and Gold. And of course, subscribe to our channel if you have not done so yet. And head over to blueandgold.com, your home for Notre Dame football um, athletics and uh, recruiting coverage. One dollar for one year of premium access. That deal won't be allowed around for much longer. So make sure you sign up while you still can. Okay. So Ohio State. We're gonna again. We're gonna go game by game, chronological order. Ohio State. It's this Saturday. Patrick and Tyler are going with a loss for Notre Dame. So Tyler, what what was your what was your thought here? This is too much offense for Ohio State. I mean, you got three guys who could potentially win the Heisman Trophy, obviously led by quarterback C.J. Stroud, who last I checked was a front runner to win that award ahead of the reigning champion, Alabama quarterback Bryce Young. So you've got a great quarterback, and you're going against a quarterback for Notre Dame, Tyler Buckner, who's never started a game at this level. I know he got a lot of reps last year, but a lot of times these top five games come down to quarterback play. C.J. Stroud's going to play better. He's surrounded by better guys. Travion Henderson, the running back, is probably a top five back in college football. Jackson Smith, the Jigba, might be one of the best wide receivers in college football. Some questions with Ohio State's defense. I know Jim Jim Knowles, I was actually just listening to him speak. Sounds like a very intelligent guy, really good defensive coordinator. I think it takes a little bit of time for Ohio State's defense to get good. So Notre Dame could put up some points, but I think Ohio State's going to put up more. That offense is just too high-powered. Patrick? Yeah, I think it's just too big an ask in this spot for a first-time starting quarterback making the first start head coach in his regular season debut. When you contrast that with what Ohio State going, has going on uh, on the other side with the experience and talent, a QB receiver, and it's kind of steady operation there and as, as far as coaching goes. So I think a, a win here would make they make this look like the, the Georgia 2019 game where Notre Dame has a chance to win or go ahead uh, late in the fourth quarter with the ball. All right, we're just going to kind of pair a couple of these. Marshall and Kyle, I can't imagine um, that either of you guys are picking a loss there. So, yeah, first couple of home games, um, you know, should be good recruiting weekends that I will be covering, uh, of course, at Blue and Gold. And, um, yeah, Patrick, it should be pretty easy wins for Notre Dame in both of these, but also the Toledo game was a three-point win last year. Yeah, and Marshall, kind of like Toledo, has been a pretty steady group of five program. They've won at least seven games five years in a row, but even then it's still kind of hard to see how they would keep up with Notre Dame unless Notre Dame is just completely off kilter. And then Cal, eh, you could see maybe a similar script to last year's Purdue game where it's never a blowout. You know, Purdue's good enough to hang around there, but nowhere where you really feel like uh, Notre Dame is truly in a spot where like, whoa, they actually could lose this for a minute. And then they kind of control it for the second half there. I feel like that's, Maybe what that looks like in, instead of a blowout. But yeah, I, I think Notre Dame has, you know, without really sweating it and white knuckling, it ends up winning both those games. Tyler? Yeah, I, I agree completely with the Toledo and Purdue comments. I don't think Toledo, the Marshall game is going to go like the Toledo game did, where Notre Dame literally needs a last minute drive to win that game. But there could be moments where you're thinking, man, this is Marshall. What is Notre Dame doing? They're going to ultimately come out on top because they have the superior athletes. They're a superior team, bottom line. And then Cal, you're playing another Power 5 team at home. But it's kind of like Purdue where, yeah, maybe Purdue hung around that game last year, but you never really thought, oh, man, the Boilermakers are going to win. And then in the end, Notre Dame was too much. So those early season games against opponents like this just kind of – you know, going through the motions at times. And you never really want to do that as a team because you've got some good teams coming up on the schedule later on in the year. But sometimes it's not always pretty, but you do see the W's there, and I don't think they will lose either of those games. So the first game of last season was at Florida State. You know, they're, they're down, but, you know, it's a, it's a good program. And this year you go at Ohio State. So we're kind of drawing some parallels to last year's schedule. And, and the fourth game of last season was Wisconsin. Um, in in Chicago, this one at North Carolina feels a little bit similar. Um, Tyler, what was your pick for this one? It's a Notre Dame victory because I think that North Carolina defense is really bad. They just gave up 
24 points to an HBCU, I think, at home in the season opener in week zero. But look, Devin May looked really good at quarterback. Some of those throws that he made, I was like, wow, there's a reason this kid was pretty highly recruited. He can throw the football. They're not going to score. on they, they might score on Notre Dame. They're not going to score enough to beat them, even at home, even in Chapel Hill. So I expect points in that game, but more for the blue and gold than for the Tar Heels. Patrick, yep. Yeah, I'm on the same page there. I I think North Carolina's offense still looks pretty good and can be pretty tough to stop with Josh Downs and Drake May there impressing with some kind of wow throws even against an FCS team. But and you saw how creative that North Carolina playbook was in last year's game. But yeah, you know I think defense is going to be a struggle for them again. And this kind of feels like the moment where after three games it probably will be a lot for where Notre Dame learned a lot from. Uh, you know maybe some good in those two home games and some tougher moments in that Ohio state game where things kind of really start to click and they end up, you know, this looks like their best offensive game and they're able to outscore North Carolina. So the big games this season are obviously Ohio state Clemson USC. Those are the big three that everyone's circling. seems like BYU is kind of in that next tier along with North Carolina of man, Notre Dame probably has the better team, right? But it could be one where the Irish slip up. Where do our guys see this one ending up? Both W's. Um, Tyler, we'll go for you first. Um, what, what are your thoughts about this matchup in Vegas? Yeah, I think BYU is a really good team, but they lost a couple of guys that made them really good. Tyler Allgaier being one of them, the running back who's now in the NFL. I think he's with the Falcons, and it wouldn't shock me at the end of the year if he had a really good season for them. So anytime you lose a guy like that, it hurts your football team. And I think – more so than personnel on the other side in this one, it's going to be just a weird game and weird things can happen when you go to Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas and, you know, a stadium that uh, we know that Marcus Freeman, Isaiah Foskey and Michael Mayer have seen in person, but all of these other Notre Dame players haven't. So it's going to be weird. And I know it's the same thing for BYU. They don't play at this place every day either, but I think that's what Kind of like Wisconsin at Soldier Field last year. That was a, a tie game through three quarters or a one-score game through three quarters. Chris Tyree's kick return kind of changes the entire complexion of that. And then it's an interception party and, and Notre Dame runs away. I think it's going to be a game that stays close because of the unique element of it. But in the end, Notre Dame, kind of like with some of these other wins on the schedule already, they just have the better players and they should win this game. Yeah, the Mormons versus the uh, Catholics in Las Vegas. What do you think, Patrick? Yeah, I kind of see it the same way where BYU is a pretty steady team that should be able to keep up here, having won at least 10 games in two straight years. And first nationally in returning production overall and in returning production on defense, if you're looking for some reason to think a defense that wasn't very good last year might be you know, at least passable or slightly above average this year, uh, I think that might be it. But this kind of feels like one where Notre Dame has just a little bit more juice later on in the game to, to make a big play, get a, a stop late in the game where it's, it's best players show up or, or score to put the game away late where it's best offensive players go make a play. And one of those games that would be good to see where it's close and Notre Dame just finds a way to win. And I think that'd be a good reflection on, on Marcus Freeman. All right, can we just get a good old blowout in this one? I feel like, yeah, we're like, ah, oh, Notre Dame will we'll, we'll win this one. Can we, can we just get a blowout here, Patrick? Is, or is Notre Dame going to blow out Stanford in this spot? Yeah, I, I, I would be um, – as far as the Stanford resurgence goes, I know they've recruited well. Tanner McKee's gotten a lot of NFL buzz. They're a quarterback there. But this just feels like one Notre Dame can really, really own the line of scrimmage and kind of take it to them. And with, as far as if Stanford rebounds, kind of one of those believe it when you see it things after three pretty uncharacteristic years where a decade ago you wouldn't think about Notre Dame taking, to, taking it to Stanford on the line of scrimmage, but it's what they've been able to do the last couple of years they've played them, and I think that will happen again this year. Yep, Mr. Horka. Yeah, Stanford has been trending down for too long to think that all of a sudden they're going to spike upward and be what they were for, what, five to seven years, maybe even closer to a decade. So this is going to be a pretty easy win, and then that will lead right into the next one. I don't really have anything to say about UNLV. That's going to be – you want a blowout, Mike Singer? There's your blowout on the schedule. UNLV is just not a very good football program. Yeah, Patrick's also going with a win over the running Rebels. Do you have any quick thoughts to give on that one? Yeah, pretty much any computer ranking or human ranking that you're going to find, UNLV is going to be the lowest rated team on Notre Dame's schedule. This kind of has those just good vibes, get another win, keep rolling kind of game. Is is Syracuse – you guys are both picking wins for Syracuse, but could that be a tricky one, Tyler? 
I think absolutely it's tricky because of kind of that BYU element. Uh, this is a place that does not feel like college football Saturday when you go to – I'm going to call it the Carrier Dome. I know it's called something else now. Patrick probably knows the name. It slipped JMA my mind. What's that? The JMA Dome. I don't know what that the is. JMA Dome, yeah, exactly. It's not the JMA Dome. It's the Carrier Dome to me. Uh, funny enough, quarterback for Syracuse is Garrett Schrader. I used to cover him at Mississippi State. He's a playmaker. Go look at his uh, – he had this helicopter spinning play where he got shot up into the air against Kansas State. I think it was the 2019 season. You guys are going to be better for having watched that play because it's both hilarious and impressively awesome at the same time. I think he can make plays. And if it's a weird game, he'll keep Syracuse in there. But kind of the theme with a lot of these games, and I've been saying it over and over, Notre Dame shouldn't lose because it has players like Isaiah Foskey and – uh, maybe Michael Mayer for sure. You got two guys on the on the other side of the ball, or two guys on both sides of the ball for Notre Dame right there. That Syracuse simply does not have. So unless something goes terribly wrong, Notre Dame's not losing in Syracuse. But yeah, I'm, I'm I'm with you there. This is one of those where you just need Notre Dame's best players to to be better than than Syracuse. I know it sounds simple, like it's. That's how you prevent weird stuff from ultimately costing you a game there. And Syracuse, I don't know that you're too afraid of Garrett Schrader as a passer, but can make plays with his legs. They have a really, really good running back in Sean Tucker. So this is a game where you really want Notre Dame's run defense that should be pretty good this year to, to live up to that and kind of shut that down. And, and if so, I would have a hard time seeing Syracuse winning this thing unless Notre Dame's offense just completely breaks down and scores like three points. All right, so we're at 7-1. and one. You guys are in agreement. I'll show the uh, the result that you guys think after we hear from you both. Tyler, what are you going with here and why? I think a lot of people are down on Clemson right now after last season. Look, DJ Yongalale, I, I, I suck at pronouncing that name, so I'm just going to call him DJU upon further reference. He had a bad year, but he played behind a bad offensive line. It was just a bad offensive season for Clemson, but they somehow scraped out a 10 and two season that's double digits. And I know you expect 11 and one, 12 and 0 with Clemson, especially in the ACC. I think they're going to rebound. And let's talk about the defensive side of the ball. They've got a bunch of guys who could be all Americans. I think they have a, a defensive tackle who played like a month of the season last year and still wound up on the AC, all ACC third team. They have uh, the reigning at ACC freshman of the year in the secondary who can make plays. Their defensive ends can get to the quarterback. If you want, uh, you know, a nationally televised game and for a team to just kind of go in there and, and create chaos and just hound Notre Dame's start first year starting quarterback Tyler Buckner and frustrate Tommy Reese and have Marcus Freeman kind of standing clueless on the sideline, I think it's Clemson. Dabo Sweeney's still a really good college football coach, probably the second best in America. So all of that said, I'm going with Notre Dame's second loss of the season coming to the Clemson Tigers at home, Notre Dame Stadium, November 5th. Yes, yeah, will be a huge recruiting weekend as well. Prime time, all that stuff, especially if it's a 7-1 Notre Dame versus an undefeated or one-loss Clemson. Are you rolling with uh, Tyler's prediction as well, Patrick, or, or do you see Notre Dame eking out a win here? I'm in agreement with Tyler there. I think it's just kind of one of those games where, you know, the inexperience or the the bumps that come through an entire first season as a starting quarterback, maybe kind of show up here and, and not through any fault of, of Buckner per se, especially uh, given that you know, context in which I just outlined, but because this is a really, really good uh, talented Clemson defense that I know doesn't have defensive coordinator Brent Venables anymore. And we heard all about through the years, how instrumental he was, but uh, the personnel here is still going to be really, really impressive. And, and they're kind of the one game, maybe outside of Ohio state where uh, as much as you think Notre Dame's offensive line can, can really take a step this year where it might have an equal here in, in Clemson's defensive line that, you know, you could certainly see that uh, going Clemson's way with the, 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 the future pros and, and potential first round picks they have up there. So yeah, not that Clemson doesn't have questions either with DJ Uyangole and, and how much he had struggled last year. And if you want to buy that resurgence, you can. I think it's kind of a wait and see thing, even though it was kind of hard to believe he fell so much after what he was able to do at Notre Dame Stadium two years ago. But I think this kind of has that 
defensive feel lower scoring kind of, you know, low twenties might be able to win this thing kind of setting. But in this kind of case, I, I think I'll take Clemson and, and how Dapos when he's able to get, to get them ready. And even with all the transition they've had there, you know, this would be game, what, two months into the season game nine, it looks like we have it where, you know, they would have settled into to some of those new things that maybe don't feel so new anymore. But then again, maybe you can say that for Tyler Buckner's first start, but or ninth start, sorry, I should say, compared to first, but going to go with Clemson here. I have it listed as an at Navy. I'm pretty sure it's a neutral site, but look, it, for, for all intents and purposes, you know, it's it's like a Navy home game on November 12th. Can't imagine that either of these guys are picking that as a loss for Notre Dame. And then, so let's just pop on the next two. Wins across the board at Navy. Um, and then, yeah, Boston College, the uh, homecoming for former Irish quarterback Phil Dracovic. I'll throw this to you, um, Patrick. What are your thoughts on these two games quickly? Yeah, we've seen Navy kind of go zero to a hundred as far as not have a very good season and then turn it around and win nine, 10 games before. But even so it hasn't really been a problem game for Notre Dame when Notre Dame has been at its best in a 10 plus win level team like it has. So uh, I kind of see it going, going the same way. And uh, I'm not sure that this Navy roster is in for that kind of turnaround or big jump anyway. And then Boston college, I think kind of a, a sneaky team and going to be really well coached with Jeff Halfley there, but not one that probably has the juice and especially on offense around Phil Dracovic to go in there and, and really pull a, an upset at Notre Dame stadium. So don't know that that's going to be a, a blowout, but uh, I still end up kind of, maybe kind of like Cal in the sense of, you know, it's, it's close for a little bit, never a blowout, but not really a moment where it's like, Whoa, Notre Dame is in jeopardy of losing this. Yep, Tyler. Navy blowout, and I don't have much more to say about that. That's one of those games where a neutral site is not going to make a difference. And you look up at the end of the day, and Notre Dame won 41 to 10 or something like that. Boston College, I'm very intrigued by because John McNulty's coming back. Patrick mentioned Phil Jerkovic. George Takis, who was at Notre Dame just last year with McNulty, kind of cool, but I think it's business like for Notre Dame. They, you know, you get through all those homecomings rather quickly. You, you get between the white lines and Notre, Notre Dame wins by multiple scores. Maybe not a blowout, but one of those games, kind of like earlier in the year, Marshall Cal, never in doubt, take care of business. All right, so, so far you guys are in complete agreement. That's what, nine and two. Will we have a disagreement here? Um, Tyler, we'll, we'll go with you. Notre Dame at USC, November 26th. The Irish get to 10 wins in the regular season. What say you? I say no. And I'm going to kind of preface this with I'm not buying all this USC national title hype, college football playoff hype. I think they've got like the fifth or sixth best odds to win the national championship right now. No, that's not going to happen. Can they go 10 and 2 and cap a really good season? Kind of a USC is coming back season with Lincoln Riley and Caleb Williams, Jordan Addison, all these other guys cap that kind of season with a win over what will be a nine and two ranked Notre Dame team. Absolutely. I think there's a very good chance that both of these teams go into that game nine and two. If there ever was going to be a really good home environment at the LA Coliseum again, it would be a couple of ranked, you know, a ranked USC team and a ranked Notre Dame team. So I've seen too much of Lincoln Riley having gone to the University of Texas to say that they're not going to be any good this year. Uh, I think they're going to be really good offensively. Um, not really predicting a shootout, but I'm predicting USC with Caleb Williams to make enough plays in the end to beat uh, Tyler Buckner, who you look up and down that schedule, um, you know, it's bookended by his two toughest road games, I would say. So he's not going to really see that type of environment for a few months. It might get to him. Caleb Williams is going to make a few more plays than Tyler Buckner. Yeah, I – I'm going to take Notre Dame to win here and I think it's the, probably the biggest toss up game on the schedule, but like Tyler said, really going to be hard to defend with Lincoln Riley, who I think has proven to be as, as good as, if not better, uh, an offensive mind and offensive coach as there's been in college football the last few years, really talented quarterback that we saw him work with at Oklahoma and, and Caleb Williams last year and the other weapons they were able to pull out of the transfer portal. But I think by this time, this is game 12, you're going to have, Buckner having 11 games of learning and, and improvement and, and 
lessons and everything that comes through it under his belt. Same with Tommy Reese as far as how to call a game with Buckner at QB and having planned that. And same with Freeman for having gone through almost a full season. I, I think that even if you can you, know, you contrast it to Caleb Williams having played last year and Lincoln Riley's resume as a coach, uh, I think you're going to have settled into enough of a groove to be able to take advantage of USC defense. That's was really, really bad last year. And even if you expect it to jump up with better coaching, which I do, can, I don't know how high you can vault year over year as far as now just expecting, I think a win for them would be we had for USC is having an average defense. And I think Notre Dame at this point will be able to exploit that. And I, I trust its defense to slow down that USC attack enough to be able to keep it within whatever you might call the lower range of a shootout. And, you know, given that suspect defense or average at best defense, I think USC will field. And I think right now I'm taking Notre Dame to be able to take advantage of that and pull out a win here to end the season. When is the last time USC beat Notre Dame? It's been years. <laughs> so yeah, that was Notre Dame's abysmal season. I just think Notre Dame's kind of got a little, there's a little boogeyman for, for USC. I have personally, I have the same win loss as Patrick does. I got 10 and two, um, but yeah, it, it, that that's going to be a tight one. So there you have it. Tyler Horga's got nine and three. Patrick Angle going ten and two. I think um, obviously Angle's prediction would be a little bit more welcome getting to ten wins. But for Marcus Freeman's first season as Notre Dame head coach, I think that um, nine wins would would be um, uh, acceptable as a relative term. But for me, um, that would be so. Okay. Notre Dame fans, appreciate you guys watching. Stick around to the end of this video. Make sure you guys hit the thumbs up. Subscribe to our channel. Head to blueandgold.com. $1 for one year. Appreciate you all, and we'll catch you next time.